So this is, as it says, a lesson about today. I started, decided to start a series about today. It actually started a, this is how these things go. It started when I remember Jesus saying, sufficient for the day is its own worry, because I was very worried one day. And it's good to remember things that Jesus said, of course. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'm going to get looking at that and study that and see what, what else is in there. And it really did go in uh, some different directions. The first of which is this, do not be anxious, that we'll talk about under the heading of today. Uh, there is another thing underneath today, which is going more along the lines of the wandering in the wilderness and how the, the people learned in that wandering to accept some setbacks. He allowed them to hunger. He allowed them to thirst that they might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's a different lesson about today, but we'll get there, the Lord willing. Now, this today, 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 <laughs> today on today, we're talking about do not be anxious, which is a thing that is a command. And, you know, uh, the command in and of itself kind of makes me anxious. I don't know about you. I hear, oh, don't be anxious. Oh, I better not get anxious. I think I'm getting anxious about getting anxious, and I'm not supposed to get anxious. You know, That's what happens to me anyway. I don't know if that happens to you. You may not be as sick as I am. Or this slide. There you go. And Matthew 6, 34, Jesus said, do not be anxious about tomorrow. I left the therefore on the slide because there is other stuff leading up to it, and that's the wandering in the wilderness stuff. But today we're focusing on this one. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's true. <laughs> Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Yeah, there's going to be enough tomorrow. The fact is, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We got enough to deal with today. And it's all you can actually deal with. So here's the thing to remember with Matthew 6, 34, and I say this not, I don't mean to be flippant in any way. I, I rejoice in it, I guess. that you don't have to get through the week, you know? Sometimes you start thinking, oh, I just got to get through this week. No, you don't. Or I just got to get through this month, this semester, this year, whatever. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can't do it. It's not even possible. You cannot get through this week. It's not possible. You can get to bedtime tonight. That you can do. Tomorrow is not here. You can't do anything about it. That's just the truth. Now, not to say don't make any plans or don't have any contingencies or blow your entire, you know, bank balance today because tomorrow never comes because, you know, they're, they're, you know, as sure as you do that, there will be one, right? But you know what I'm saying, I think, and more importantly, you know what the Lord is saying. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, figure out what can I do today before bedtime. That's what God wants you to do today. And that may not include some things that you're concerned about that are coming up. Sure. Well, what do you do about that? Well, maybe you make a plan or decide what could be done about that. Can that be done today? When could that be done? Maybe today what you do is you write those things down or those thoughts or those questions, even if it's, uh, you know, I need to figure this out by, you know, three days from now or whatever. Well, then make a calendar thing. And three days from now, when, when that becomes today, here's a thing you can do today <laughs> before bedtime. But don't worry about it until then. Because you can't. You, you don't have to get through the week. You just have to get to bed tonight. That's it. That's all we got right now. It's the only thing you can do anything about can't change the past. Tomorrow never gets here. It's always today. And there's a reason for that beyond, you know, the obvious. There are reasons for why it's always today. Today is the day of salvation is why. This is the day to obey God. You can't change what happened before today. 
and can't go into the future and make things occur, today's what you got. This is the day to be saved. This is the day to make things right with God. That's it. It's all you can do. All right, so that's Matthew 6.34. Now, on to what does it mean? Don't be anxious. What is anxiety? Well, anxiety is what connects that uh, Matthew uh, 6.34 with Philippians 4. And this was one of the directions the study went in that I wasn't anticipating. Please bear with me on this. But they are definitely related. In, math, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, you may be familiar with these verses too. But I want to look at them in detail. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I tell you, rejoice. I've read that for so long, right? And I thought, man, I've, I should probably do more rejoicing than I do because I read the verse, but I don't always feel like rejoicing. <laughs> so let's keep going. Well, what else does he have to say? Well, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So let everybody know that you are reasonable. You can be approached. You are peaceful. Because the Lord is at hand. The time is short. This begins to look like, hmm, don't be anxious for tomorrow. Today has enough to do. And then the sixth verse, do not be anxious about anything, but rather in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want to go back and six and seven are the main focus. The pair of verses, six and seven, are the main focus. The verses individually are the main foci. And I know if everybody's struggling with that, the way Nico has been mentioning to me in his homework lately. <laughs> But we got two verses, six and seven, that we are looking at. First is, do not be anxious about anything. Rather than be anxious, the formula is, let requests be made known to God. So in the same way that we might do with business, finance, scheduling, where we, today, we maybe make a plan, or even we just set dates for when we're going to think about this again and make a reminder in the calendar, right? That's, in some sense, that's offloading it. Uh, deferring, but not deferring without knowing what is to take place. It's not like an open-ended, still occupying the mind of worry because you know it's going to be dealt with appropriately. Right? That's the organizational mind. In the same way, the Lord says we're not anxious because we put our requests onto God. He will not forget. He will not leave it. He will not walk away. And these are our requests, not about schedule or finance. These are our spiritual needs, our real, actual needs in God. The things that are troubling us in life, the issues of life. So the that formula is don't be anxious. Instead of being anxious, let requests be made known to God. Put it on him. That's offloading it or uh, redirecting it where it can go, which is to God. How does it do so? It does so by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. When we do this, as, as in our, you know, the Lord never dismisses your anxiety as, ah, you, you don't need to worry about that. He never says that. That's not a kind thing to say, by the way. <laughs> he says, come to me, you heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. And he'll help you. So we bring these and we make that known to God. And that is how the seventh verse comes to be. The peace of God guards the heart's the peace of God guards the thoughts, actually, the minds. In the, uh, another way of translating that seventh verse, the peace of God, which overcomes any mindset, will place your hearts and your thoughts under guard inside Christ Jesus. And uh, that's the LZV, if you're interested. 
<laughs> What's the LZ? That's Luis Zamora version. That's mine. <laughs> I translated that. <laughs> okay. But the point being, I wanted to get across that the underlying language, when we say the peace of God surpasses all understanding, that doesn't mean you can't understand it. Don't try to explain it. It's better felt than told. That's not what it means at all. It's saying, it's, this, it's actually the same root of the mind or the thought that the peace of God overcomes any mindset, any way of thinking, any mind that you have, a mind to do this or whatever. It overcomes that by placing the, your thoughts inside this container, this guard uh, or castle, which is Jesus, the anointed, the Christ. So that's how God works. He brings peace to you regarding your troubles when you load them onto him, when you make those things known to him by guarding the heart and guarding the mind inside of Jesus. Your trust in him is not misplaced. Your faith in him is, is well placed. So, next point would be mechanics. Let's look at the details here in Philippians 4. Because it is the simple formula, and, and really that's all there is to this. We, 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 the Lord said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. All right, how do we not be anxious? Well, Philippians 4 told you, don't be anxious, but rather make requests known to God. And God will put your heart and your thoughts inside the safety of Jesus. How do you do it? That's the mechanics. That's all we're looking at. Is so, okay, today's the day. I'm going to start doing this, right? <laughs> if I haven't been already. i start doing this today. What am I concerned about? What am I worried about? What is on the mind Give those to God and trust him and see the peace that does come from knowing you have settled this matter. You have addressed what needs to be addressed. And you're doing what can be done today before bedtime. First thing is, remember he said prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let's talk about prayer. Replace worry with prayer. You have a thing, it's troubling, it's real. No dismissing real concerns. Take that thing to God in prayer. Right? Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask in prayer, you if you will receive. If you have trust. If you trust God. You're asking God things that you know are right to ask for. You're putting before God things that you know are things he approves of, that further his purpose, or that bless you as his child. If you ask it in trust, in faith, then you will receive it. Jesus made it very simple. You believe in God, you trust in God, then whatever you ask, you're going to get. Or Jesus is a liar, right? We wouldn't say that. Well, no, I don't mean that. Well, no, I know you don't. And, and may you never say it, but didn't he say, if this is in the faith and you pray about it, you know you're going to get it? Yes, he did. He's not wrong. And James says the same thing in a different way, where he talks about Elijah, James 5.17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. In three and a half years, it didn't. He prayed again, and the heavens were opened, and there was rain, and there was blessing. But the point is, he's a man with a nature like ours, Elijah the prophet was, just a regular fella. And his prayer, which was fervent, but nonetheless, his prayer 
that it may not rain for a year, years and a half a year, was answered. It didn't rain because it was the will of God at that time to get the attention of Israel, to bring the king of Israel to humility. So Elijah could have been very worried about what is the king going to do? What is the king's wife going to do? The real king. <laughs> but instead, he put it to God in prayer. See, now it's three and a half years. That's a long time. That's a lot of days. That's a, what is that, like a thousand days? The other thing that we read in Philippians 4 was supplication. Supplication. And uh, this is a request. You know, something that you're asking for. Um, you know, our prayers are when we reach out to God and, and speak with him. This is maybe the things that are on the wish list, <laughs> the supplications. And we're told in 1 Peter 3.12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The ears of the Lord are open to their supplication. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, if you are the child of God and you are doing the will of God, you're doing right. You have his eyes and ears. You have an audience with God the Father, which is something you know about because of Jesus. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2. You can approach God. We have boldness to approach the throne room of grace, the throne of grace, says Hebrews. What is that boldness? It's Jesus his sacrifice that tore the veil in two and opened the way into the holiest of holies. Yes, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The ears of the Lord are open to their requests. The face of the Lord, however, is against those who do evil. He won't even look at them. But you, you have an audience. So when, when you're, you have this worry, you pray about this thing, and you bring this thing to God in, in, you know, here is the list. Here is the thing that I need your help with God. Help me to know what to do or take this away or whatever it is that needs to be said. You know your life. He also said to do these with thanksgiving, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in Philippians 4, remember? That's verse 6. He also spoke of thanksgiving in another place, Colossians 4, 2, which also mentions prayer, steadfastness, vigilance, which you find, of course, I hope, very consistent with the passages we just read about Elijah spending three and a half years in prayer. <laughs> Continue steadfastly in prayer, Colossians 4, 2, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, Keeping vigil, if you will, being watchful. I mean, th this is how you attend to the matter. It isn't kind of a hovering, worrying, wringing the hands kind of anxiety. It's a, I am in prayer. I am bringing it and making it known to God. And I am giving thanks as well. Thanks for what? Well, thanks for the audience that you have with God. Thanks for the avenue of prayer by which we can approach the throne of grace. Thanks for the blessings that he has already bestowed upon us. Perhaps thanks for the outcome that you expect. And then he said, be anxious for nothing, but rather make your request known to God. So we replace worrying with praying about it, making a list that we give, that we hand over to God, and being thankful as well at the same time. But we also replace worry by making them known to Him. First John 5 tells you in verses 13 to 15, I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's us, by the way. You say, John wrote us a letter? Well, He wrote it to the saints, and we're the saints. 
and the letter stands. I write this to you. You believe in the name of the Son of God, don't you? I think you do. That you may know you have eternal life. That's why he's writing. You can know that you are God's people. You have eternal life. What's the confidence we have to say such a thing? Well, this is the confidence. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If you know what his will is, and that's what you're trying to do, and that's where the basis of your worries and concerns, well, he hears you. He hears you. Right? That's the thing. If we know that he hears us, which we do, then we also know in whatever we ask that we have the requests we have asked of, of him, which is what Jesus said back there in Matthew. But if you ask in faith, you know that you're receiving it. That's what John is saying. We know he hears us in whatever we ask. We also know that when we ask in faith, we have the request that we've asked of him. Now, this is the whole, this is the old proverb or whatever it is now, the old saw of take an umbrella if you're going to pray for rain. <laughs> but John says this to us because you can know. I, don't accept any accusation against yourself, right? You, if, if you're worried, let's say you're worried about losing your job somehow or you're losing your income. Somebody might say, well, that's just greed. No, it's not greed. Everybody needs money to live. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're not greedy. Man, you could be greedy, but that's a different problem. The fact that you're concerned about having enough money to live is perfectly reasonable. It's not greedy at all. Especially if you're concerned about having enough money to contribute to the work of the Lord, to support the faith. God sees that. And if you're asking him to help you with that, that's okay. You don't have to worry. He will make sure that you can please him in this regard, that you can discharge your duty in this regard. Lay it on him in prayer. And these, this just to say, don't allow things to frame these worries as your faults or your sins or your character flaws. That's not the case. When you are a Christian, when you're a child of God, you're worried about these things because you're trying to accomplish something. You have a goal in life to serve God, and that's guiding what you're trying to accomplish. Now, uh, there is uh, there is more to say, and I, I feel like I want to keep on moving, if you will indulge me. I'm going to try to do this. Uh, it's not very much more. I want to give an example of somebody who did what we're talking about in Philippians 4. The example is King Hezekiah, and it's found, our reading will be 2 Kings 18 and 19, 18th chapter, 19th chapter, 2 Kings. Hezekiah spread it before the Lord. And what I'm saying here is, Philippians 4, 6, let your request be made known to God, is the equivalent of 2 Kings 19, 14, when Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He had received a, an evil letter from a foreign king. He took that letter to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord, as in, he took the list to God and laid it out. In other words, he's, he's confessing, I can't do this. I need your help to do this. And instead of taking it upon himself and carrying that burden, he took it to the Lord and laid it on him. Okay, that, that's the example of faith. So starting here, just to get a, a bit of context, because I want to establish that there's plenty to worry about. Your worries are, are real. They're legitimate. Don't let anybody take that away. They're not part of your bad character. It's got nothing to do with that. In fact, this happened to Hezekiah the king after he restored the kingdom to faith. And they observed a Passover like had not been done since the days of Solomon. Hezekiah turned the clock back in faith. 
And I do like the the Chronicles version of this says, after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib came, <laughs> which is a little bit of humor, I think. I think they realize the humor in that. Um, it's true. He was a man of faith. He was living right. He was doing good. And then this horrible thing happened to him. That's like Job. That's like Jesus. They were innocent. In fact, they were good. And because they were good, Satan came for them, and bad things happened to them. That's how it is. Now, 2 Kings 18, 13, it, yes, in the reign, during the reign of Hezekiah, you have Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the guy who took Israel. They're gone. The ten tribes have already been taken captive. Jerusalem watched in horror as this happened. Now he's come over to Jerusalem and said, hey, pipe down over there, right? <laughs> the 19th verse, the, the officer, the Rabshaka, said, Tell Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. Oh, that's a great king? I was confused. I thought it was God. <laughs> On what do you rest this trust of yours? Trust, it's faith. Where is your faith? What are you trusting on, Hezekiah? 35th verse, who among all the gods of the lands? I'm skipping the letter. He's wordy because, you know, that's how they are. They think very highly of themselves. 35th verse, who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Yeah, that's evil. The Lord is a real God. Those other things, they're wood and stone. They don't count. That was dumb to begin with, literally. And this is the Lord's land. This is God's land. God gave them this land, taking them out of Egypt by a mighty hand. So in the 19th chapter, Hezekiah, on hearing this, tore his clothes, which is great mourning. Even today in, in the Middle East, when people tear their garment, it's their broken soul, broken hearted. They're very sad and in distress. He tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. He immediately went to worship God. The 14th verse is the one we read. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. This power, which took ten tribes away, certainly has the power to take Judah. And has come to the door and is saying that's what they plan to do. Does he have a legitimate concern? I think he does. <laughs> does he have the power to route it? I think he does not. But he has the faith to route it. Because his trust has rightly been placed in the real God, the real great king the real deliverer. And so, so here's how he spread it before the Lord. It's in prayer, beginning at verse 15. And we're thinking back to Philippians 4. Did, you know, if you think about Philippians 4, did, do you pray in faith? Asking in faith that you will receive? Do you do you have God's attention and audience? Do you have God's eyes and ears on you? Are you showing thankfulness all the while? Is Hezekiah doing this? Let's look. 15th verse, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. Lord, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Do we have his eyes and ears? Yes, we do. Remember? Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands. But the reason is they cast their gods into the, or the reason they cast their gods into the fire is they were not really gods. They were just the work of men's hands, wood and stone. That's why they were destroyed. 
So now, Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only true God. Right. They're being delivered, yes, but not selfishly. They're being preserved alive, yes, but not because they're cowardly. It's for the sake of the Lord. And it's true. You, as a child of God, you have every claim to the good and the right and the blessing in this life. You know, people think, uh, well, you know, you're called to suffer. Right? Don't worry about it. You'll suffer. <laughs> you don't have to look for it. <laughs> you live right. It'll come. But this is our Father's world. You are the children of God. You, t there is no reason you shouldn't have peace. There's no reason you shouldn't have resources that you can use to accomplish God's will. If resources are given to the evil and the wicked, how much more should the children of God have control of resources in this life that can be used for God's purposes? Now, it's not wrong for you to make requests to God. And in the end, what you see is that God does have the power to surpass. And look at the, me the mechanism in the final verses here, verse 20 of 2 Kings 19. At that time, Isaiah, son of Amoz, you know, the guy with the long prophet book, <laughs> that Isaiah sent to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come here to this city. He won't come into this city. He won't shoot an arrow there. Right? Not only will he not set foot inside of it, he won't get within shooting distance of it. He won't come before it with a shield. He won't cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same he shall return, and he will not come into this city, declares the Lord. How do you know? Because I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Who is on the throne of David? Oh, that's right. It's Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Christ. Christ is anointed. The Lord's anointed. Whom did God anoint? David. That's the anointed king. That's the anointed kingdom, the monarchy, Jesus and he said, I will defend the city to save it for my own sake, for the sake of my servant David. Remember in Philippians 4, he said, he will place your hearts and minds inside or under guard inside of Jesus. And in the same way here, you're reading Sennacherib, he won't get into the city. He won't even be within shot of the city. You will be safe inside here, guarded for the sake of my servant David for the monarchy that he has chosen. And, you know, his servant David is speaking through, if you will, through Hezekiah's faith in God. He had faith the way his father had faith, his, his father David, if you will, his ancestor David had faith. True, but Jesus today is the throne of David, and he is a much better king. He is eternal. He's a mediator. He is a priest, right? We are guarded the way that they were guarded. It's safe inside the perimeter of the kingdom that belongs to God. That's the kind of prayers that you need. That's the way to avoid worry in this life. That's the way to accept what he said, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You can be safe in Jesus Christ today. Tomorrow may not come, right? It's possible. The Lord may return. The world may end. Something else could happen. You might not make it to tomorrow, even if others do. There's no telling. This life is not guaranteed, and I don't say that to frighten you. I say that because it's reality. That's reality. But you can avoid the anxiety by knowing that you have made your life right with God today. Because today is the day of salvation, you see. 
There's not another day on which to become a Christian. There's not another day on which to obey the Lord. Today is the day to be saved. Are you perhaps here thinking about eternity? Perhaps worried about eternity? Well, stop worrying and do what you can do today. Obey the gospel of Jesus. Repent so that you will have a heart that is right. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God's power to save, to resurrect the dead even? You think, I'm pretty bad off, I'm pretty dead. Well, fair enough, but so was Jesus. He was good and dead, and yet he, ra he raised Jesus from the grave. It's a proof that we can all be forgiven. You say, I've done some bad things. Sure, so did Paul. Paul imprisoned Christians and tortured them to death to try to get them to blaspheme God. Have you done that? I don't think you have, but even if you have, Paul also received mercy because he acted in ignorance, in unbelief. Now that you know what is right, now that you believe, what will you do with it? You can have no anxiety about tomorrow. You can be unconcerned about the judgment by obeying God today. Put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Have his blood wash away every sin. Get that advocate in your corner that you might be able to take your every concern to God in prayer. Give him the entire list of supplications and do so with thanksgiving, knowing that you have an advocate with the Father Jesus. We stand ready to help you to obey the gospel if that is your need today. If today, as a Christian, you have not lived right, repent, make things right with God. Let us pray for you if we can, because we all need prayers. And do it today. There's not another time. If you need our prayers, need to be baptized, please let your need be known at this time while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>